Uh, Mr. Kalman. Chairman Lombiondo, Ranking Member Larson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify here today. I am the head of business development and regulatory affairs for Airware, a San Francisco-based company developing flight control systems for commercial unmanned aircraft, enabling companies to use commercial UAVs to collect, analyze, and disseminate data for a growing number of commercial applications around the world. Airware has raised over $40 million from several of the world's leading venture capital firms, and our team has more than doubled over the last year. I'm all, I also serve on the board of the Small UAV Coalition, which was formed earlier this year to promote safe commercial operations of small UAVs here in the United States. This is a critical time for the UAV industry and airware. The Small UAV Coalition and others in the community would like to ensure that the United States becomes the global leader for commercial UAV technology development and operations while maintaining the safest airspace in the world. Today I will focus on three key issues for this subcommittee. One, the current state of UAV technology and potential implications in a variety of industries. Two, the need for a risk-based approach to UAV regulations. Third, the effect of current and expected regulations on U.S. businesses. First, the UAV industry is one of the fastest growing markets here in the United States. Many here today may be familiar with the small consumer UAVs used for personal enjoyment or photography but I would like to focus on the commercial grade UAVs, which are tackling some of the biggest problems across a variety of industries. Commercial UAVs are being used for disaster management, oil and gas exploration, inspection of wind turbines, and surveying of crops. These UAVs are equipped with many technological features to ensure safety and reliability of operations, such as geofencing systems, which keep a UAV within certain altitude and distance limits, as well as away from sensitive areas. Also, contingency management systems, which in the case of an issue on board the aircraft, enable the UAV to automatically return to a safe landing location. These types of technologies are developing at an increasingly rapid rate and are enabling safe operations around the world today. In addition, NASA is also working to develop a UAS traffic management system to provide a means for safely managing a lot of these small systems. Through my past experience working at the FAA, I understand the challenge in regulating this new and revolutionary technology in the United States. There are, but there are steps we can be taking to begin to open up operational environments now. Most commercial UAV operations will take place below 400 feet, 100 feet below the typical minimum safe altitude of 500 feet for manned aviation. This brings me to my second point. We must take a new risk-based approach to regulating UAVs. For example, a very small aircraft operating over a remote farm field at 300 feet would be subject to minimal regulatory requirements, whereas a larger aircraft operating over populated areas would require highly reliable avionics, additional training, geofence technology, and fail-safe mechanisms like a parachute. These are the types of risk models being used to allow commercial operations in Europe today, including France. I am pleased that the FAA recently stated its intentions to shift to this type of model. I applaud them for this, but the critical question is how quickly can it be implemented? Finally, I'd like to discuss the effect of delayed regulations on U.S. businesses. As I mentioned, France allows low-risk commercial applications, as does Canada, the United Kingdom, Australia, and many other countries. The United States, typically a leader in aviation, is one of only a few countries that currently prohibits commercial UAV operations, except pursuant to an exemption. While we wait, small and large businesses in the United States are moving UAV testing and operations abroad, where regulations are more advanced. Delayed and overly restrictive regulations aren't just slowing the growth of the UAV industry. Many of the largest industries and corporations in America see this technology as key for remaining competitive in the global marketplace. Airware has raised a strategic investment from one of the largest corporations in America, General Electric, who could use UAVs across many of their different business units. The Farm Bureau has also recently noted that U.S. farmers will not be able to keep up with foreign competitors if they are not allowed to use the same technology. UAV technology will have a major impact on our economy. In the first three years of integration, conservative estimates include creating more than 70,000 jobs and adding $13.6 billion into the economy. With each year of integration delays, the U.S. loses more than $10 billion in potential economic impact. We want the jobs, economic benefits, and core intellectual property created from this work to be here in the United States. We know that no matter the outcome today, UAV technology will create jobs, it will save lives, and it will grow the economies of those countries with the foresight to act. The United States is poised to lead the way for this growing and game-changing industry. We have the talent 
and the workforce to create the technology needed to safely integrate into the world's most complex airspace. Let's act quickly before major opportunities are lost. Thank you. I look forward to answering your questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kelman. This question to Captain Moak, Mr. Kelman, and Mr. Arroy. Uh, there, there appears to be a uh, n not to be permitted to, to operate beyond the line of sight. Uh, and if that were the case, my concern is it would significantly reduce or almost eliminate uh, the benefits that a UAS system brings to us. So can you comment on that specific, I mean, the, the beyond the line of sight? I think this gets back to the earlier point I made on taking a risk-based approach. So in the case of beyond line of sight uh, operations, you would be in, in a scenario where there are higher risks, but I think you can mitigate that through technology. So, for example, in France today, what they're doing for beyond line of sight operations is they are only operating at, at very low altitudes where they, there isn't general aviation traffic or commercial traffic, and they're enhancing it through technology, such as cameras on board, the system where an operator can actually see if there's other traffic in the area. Um, to the point on lost link scenarios, they're utilizing technology I mentioned earlier for contingency management, so in the case where you do lose link with your operator, you're able to pre-program in so the UAV knows exactly how to respond in those cases. So depending on what the area is, what the environment is, it knows what a so safe location is to return to. Um, so these are the types of technologies that are already in place today. Do you have some comments on uh, just generally what uh, an ideal environment for these test sites would look like? Or yeah, absolutely. How they'd operate, that is. Yeah, and I agree. I mean, I think the important thing for test sites is, is the ease of access so that small companies, large companies all have the same opportunities to go utilize the airspace. Um, obviously, safety is of utmost importance. So being able to do that safely through, for example, issuing a notum to other operators in the area so that they understand that there is some testing going on in these areas. But ensuring that these areas are able to allow for companies to get that approval and be able to come and utilize that space quickly and rapidly and, and at low cost to these companies. Is there any scenario where, uh, uh, since you're in private sector, where you can envision a, a, uh, a test to operation scenario? Where you sort of, you know, we're like on the Armed Services Committee, we sort of broke through some of the acquisition on certain things to sort of, mm -hmm. you know, to break through the um, slowness of the Pentagon to act on things. Is there, Using that model, is there a scenario where we can get to a test to operation scenario at, the, at these test sites in certain cases? Absolutely, and I think that could be very valuable. And I know uh, organizations like NASA Ames are already engaged in looking at things like this um, to, to allow companies to bring their technology to showcase what it's capable of doing um, and ensuring that it will respond safely in a variety of different scenarios. I think that will be very important um, to, to have, and I think that there should be infrastructure for that. Transponders. But how small can a useful transponder be these days? Some of the smaller transponders that can be used now in uh, UAVs are, can, can be right now about the size of a cell phone, maybe even smaller. A uh, what? Cell phone? Yeah, about cell phone size. So th those are some of the smaller systems. There's, there's still some, some costs associated, um, but I think that, that they could be a helpful technology when you're at a higher altitude where there could be other traffic in the area. Right. The I low mean, altitudes. If we, you know. Yeah. If we said over a certain altitude, you've got to have a transponder. In, in certain kinds of critical airspace, you've got to have a transponder. I mean, because right now these things are invisible. Yep. So right now get that done. Crude so. radar system. So yep. that's correct. Um, okay. And then this lost link. I'm, I'm very, I mean, that's, uh, that's been a problem with the military. Uh, you know, you think you've got that nailed in terms of having, if you have the geospatial restrictions and that's all somehow programmed in and this, these things can find a safe harbor point remotely and they know they've lost the link so they're going to go to that point? Mm -hmm. Typically how that would work is uh, the manufacturers of the vehicles know uh, what a safe you know, amount of lost link time is um, and, and for example they can, they can specify in certain applications where loss, uh, link is absolutely critical and if there's any sort of lost link it needs to immediately return to, uh, to the landing location in a way that is safe. Um, in other cases, a lot of these systems are so highly autonomous that, that interruptions in the link may not be as important if it's in an area where it's controlled. Um, so it's all depending on the risk of the situation, and you can actually program a lot of that into the actual avionics of the system. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Meadows. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to follow up on some of what you were just sh sharing, uh, Mr. Coleman. You, you know, you talked a lot about uh, technology and where we are 
you know, we see a, an aircraft sitting in front of uh, uh, Captain Moak there. Um, is it possible to put in the type of technology, or can you expand on the types of technology that would uh, increase safety but yet not require a air uh, you know, uh, an aircraft license mm -hmm. as uh, the gentleman to your right is, is advocating that would keep us safe? What other technologies are out there? Yeah, so I, I mentioned two very important ones, the geofence technology, uh, which is very common in the industry and can be used on vehicles as, as small as the ones you see here. Um, the contingency management functionality, but it gets to the loss link, um, also loss of GPS functionality so that should the vehicle no longer be able to make itself aware of where it is, um, it knows how to land safely. There's a lot of really great research going on right now here in the United States and other parts of the world. Um, that Professor Roy talked about on sense and avoid technology. Um, I think that's going to be a critical piece for enabling a lot of these higher risk applications at higher altitude um, with you know, other traffic in the air and there's already very significant in advancements in that area as well. So how confident are you that if we do not change our regulatory scheme that Canada, Australia, Europe will own this type of uh, technology and on a scale of one to ten, being most confident that if we don't change things, that we're going to lose out. I, I, I would say I'm pretty confident because we're seeing a lot of the the highly skilled manufacturers in Europe um, really surpassing a lot of the U.S. companies because of their ability to go and iterate, do very frequent testing, do a lot of research on their products, um, where they're able to actually go two or three generations in their products, where where a U.S. company may only be able to do it once. So we are we are starting to see some of that. So they're, they're actually doing a lot more testing in Europe or Canada or other places than we are here. It's just because a lot of the, the main manufacturers there have easy access to uh, testing facilities. Some experts have talked about integrating privacy by design. Uh, you know, we're talking about safety. What about privacy here? This is a, a concern, a genuine concern that the larger public has, I think. Um, are you aware of any technology uh, solutions to the privacy issue? To the, to the privacy issue, and I think it's, it's important to state that privacy is definitely one of the things of utmost important for the UAV industry and a lot of the companies in it. Um, and to your point on privacy by design, I think a lot of manufacturers are engaging in this today and, and doing things like restricting, for example, where cameras can and cannot turn on on board the aircraft, protecting that valuable information. Um, but, but ultimately, I, I feel that privacy is really um, it's really independent of the type of technology that's, that's collecting that information. I, I feel that privacy is really about what information is private, what information is public, and ensuring that we protect that independent of the different types of collection methods. Uh, one of the major issues with uh, UAVs is the flyaway problem, you know, where they lose connectivity and fly away. Uh, it affects uh, consumer uh, UAVs, but also uh, very high-end aircraft with the military. Uh, how do we mitigate that risk and how do we uh, integrate this into our, our uh, aviation system? Yeah, and I think uh, to reiterate also that safety, again, is of utmost importance. And I, and I think with the flyaway issues, that's, that's, a, that's a matter of technology. Um, I, I think that the technology is increasing at, at a very rapid pace. Um, I mentioned earlier a lot of the uh, functionality in a lot of these systems to, to manage a lot of issues that happen on board the aircraft. Typically, that's where you'll see those types of things. They'll, you'll lose the GPS or something along those lines. Um, so making sure that the, the systems have the ability to know how to automatically respond should any system fail on board the aircraft and be able to return it to a location that is determined safe uh, before the flight. So I think those will be very, very important to, uh, to ensure. All right. I'd like to thank all the witnesses for their testimony and in absentia the other members for their participation in today's program. The subcommittee stands adjourned.